Lady, weak and wounded, sick and sore, Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love and power. Come ye thirsty, come and welcome God's free bounty, glorify True belief and true repentance Every grace that brings you
right, you guys can go ahead and take a seat. Sorry, I wasn't ready. Okay, um, so as you guys know, today is Father's Day. Um, so we are going to recognize the dads that we have. Um, however, I just wanted to encourage you, just in the Lord, um, Ephesians 6 starts by saying, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers... Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so I just wanted to encourage us um, in bringing our children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Um, and we have a really good example of this in um, Deuteronomy 6, um, 5 through 7. Um, and this is when the Lord is giving... Moses, the Ten Commandments, and then Moses is also teaching the Israelites about the Ten Commandments. Um, verse 5 says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And verse 6, uh, these And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And thou shalt talk of them while thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And I just wanted to challenge um, the dads and all of all of us really that we can't teach these um, these things to our children unless they're in our hearts first. It says in six, um, which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And so, just to it, to encourage all of us to be diligent in hiding God's word in our heart, so that way we can. Um, teach our children also um, in the way that they should go. Um, and so with that, uh, we would love if all, if you are a father, if you would stand up, please. Um, and I just wanted to end with a prayer for our dads real quick. Um, Lord God, we thank you for our fathers that are here. We thank you for um, those who are hoping to be fathers, those who are grieving, uh, maybe a loss of their own father, um, the dads that are with us. Um, and for you, Lord, just being our heavenly father, um, that perfect example for them to look up to. And, um, Lord, we pray that you would continue to show us who you are in your word, um, that we may be faithful to invest it into the lives of our physical and spiritual children, Lord. Um, and we pray this in your son's name. Amen. All right. Well, thank you for uh, that, Lindsay. Um, I appreciate the, the thoughts and uh, certainly have um, a, a good father that we're here to praise and worship today, and we have a lot of reasons to worship and praise him. And so uh, before we get back into that, though, let's get through uh, some announcements. Uh, we started our summer renovations yesterday at uh, the new property, which was really awesome. Um, and so I, I, think, uh, I think a few of us might tap out after that. That was, that was hot, you know. 
Uh, so we're all sore today, but it was good. Uh, sweet time uh, just to be together. Uh, accomplished a lot, and, and so we'll see some pictures of that later. Uh, but again, just want to encourage people. Th these are going to be going on every Saturday um, all the way through August, so um, it, usually in the mornings uh, is when we'll be getting together. So uh, come out there. Uh, be a part of this effort. Uh, be praying how to be a part of this effort. It's a good time, and so um, we're, we're making some memories out there. Uh, there's a kids' meeting. Anybody who works in the kids' ministry here at LFT, uh, next Sunday after our service, there'll be a kids' meeting. It'll probably be upstairs. And so just make sure uh, you're planning on attending that again if you're already serving in that capacity. Um, FOI airport rides, uh, those are um, starting to pick up. Uh, at least we're getting students signing up. And so if you haven't registered uh, to drive on those, see Mark or James. Uh, uh, they can shoot you a link to get registered, and it's pretty easy. Uh, if you're registered already, go ahead and, and take a look and, and, and see and find somebody to, to pick up. I, we want to encourage everyone to pick up at least one student um, this summer as these students come into the fall. What an opportunity. Uh, we see it here uh, in, in this body. Um, you know, so many people have put their faith in Christ because of airport pickup rides. I mean, that's where it really starts. That's the point of contact. Uh, and, 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 of course, then you bring them in and you're able to just be with them at FOI and, and then they, they, they come into church and you have awesome conversations. And so uh, it's more than just a, a pickup. I mean, uh, obviously we're, but that's, that's just where we're, that's still how we're getting that first point of contact with them. And so uh, be praying about, again, how to serve in that uh, ministry as well. And so, um, again, get with Mark or James if you're not signed up for that. And uh, let's all you know, commit to picking at least one student up. And so that's it. We're all going to stand. We're going to go back to worshiping the Lord. We're going to have an offering here, uh, take an offering in just a moment when we sing again. And so we'll pray for that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that at the end of the service as well as far as giving. But let's all stand, pray, and let's go back to the Lord and worship. Father, I thank you again just... Um, just for your faithfulness, um, Lord, we're just seeing it all around us. Um, but Lord, even today, I know a, a day that's um, a special day. I know there are some who are grieving, as Lindsay just prayed. And so, uh, Father, our hearts are with them today. Um, and those who uh, just are out there who, who do miss their fathers, and there's so many of them. And, and Lord, we were just uh, thankful for uh, uh, just the fathers in our lives who were good to us, and, and uh, Lord, even those who uh, may be a uh, difficult relationship, Lord, they're uh, still our fathers. And so, um, Lord, we just pray that, um, that everybody can see uh, the design of the father in the family uh, is the type of father that you are. And, Lord, we all fail in that capacity in some way or another in our lifetime. Uh, but, but, Father, you don't. And, and so, uh, Lord, that alone is enough to come and just praise and worship you this morning. And so, uh, Lord, we, it's what we pray today is that you're just glorified and honored in the time that we have here uh, set aside to be in your word. Uh, Lord, that you would teach us, that you would change us. Um, Lord, that we would be on mission and, 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 and do it the way you would want us to do it. Um, and, and that you would receive all the honor and the glory and the praise. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
with all adoring wonder. His blessings I retrace.
Lord, we just come before you and we thank you for this time to just gather as a body and um, have fellowship and just focus our hearts on you and worship you and praise you. And Lord, I pray our hearts would be open to your word this morning, um, that you would just be changing our lives. I love you and I thank you. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, happy Father's Day again to all of our fathers. Um, Today is bittersweet for me. Um, I've got all my kids here. That's awesome. And so uh, I'm thankful for that. Uh, Earlier this year, I lost my father. And so that's, you know, makes it harder. But um, I know James, James and Em are going through the same thing. So... um, yeah. Thank you. But uh, dads, I am so thankful for each of you and uh, for not only what you mean to your families, uh, but for what, what you mean to uh, this body. And, and so thank you. So uh, be turning in your Bibles over to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Um, We're going to finish up chapter 9 and actually uh, start chapter 10 today. The passage that we're going to look at isn't necessarily directed uh, to our fathers, but uh, there'll be be applications here for you, Dad, so you won't get off the hook this morning. Um, We we have some things directed for each of you as well. Uh, But before we get into this uh, new passage this morning, uh, as you know, we have to review a little bit, and especially for those who haven't been with us through this series, and uh, I want to catch you up to uh, speed on what what we've been talking about. So the intent of this book of Ecclesiastes, you could just say it with me because you've heard me say this a thousand times already, is to display the faultiness and folly of all human reasoning under the sun. You didn't say it with me. That's okay. Uh, To display the faultiness and folly of all human reasoning under the sun. Uh, so this is what we uh, have been focusing on. Everything we find in this life under the sun is ultimately going to fail us. It's ultimately going to be vain, and it's going to bring vexation of spirit. This is what Solomon talks about. Vexation of spirit is just the disappointments of life. If you haven't been disappointed by life yet, you probably haven't lived long enough yet. Uh, just wait. You'll get some disappointments. They'll, they'll be coming. Uh, sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Uh, That's just how this life under the sun works. However, life above the sun, totally different. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. And so the question today is not which side of the sun you're living on, you're currently at, but which side of the sun are you living for? And so this is what we've been talking about. So the book is written uh, from a human perspective, including all the human reasonings and experiences that man goes through and all their faulty conclusions. And we'll get to some of Solomon's conclusions here in a few weeks. Don't forget that Ecclesiastes, like Proverbs, is a wisdom book. We're going to see this again. We talked about this at the very beginning of this series. I've mentioned it a few times, and today uh, we'll mention it again because we're going to see that word wisdom a lot in the passage we're going to look at. And so Solomon wrote Proverbs early in his life, and that's what I call his pure wisdom days. Uh, He wrote Ecclesiastes later in his life. That's what I call his hard wisdom days. And uh, anybody relate? You have some some pure wisdom days? Oh, yeah, this is awesome. I'm doing that. And you stay in it. And then what happens? Well, ultimately, we fail. Ultimately, we we, uh, sin enters the picture. And And ultimately, we find ourselves in a place of having to come back through uh, that path of wisdom the hard way and uh, learn things the hard way. And so I've given you this chart each each week. Uh, Pure wisdom is is preventative. It keeps us from things. Hard wisdom is corrective. Pure wisdom is idealistic. It's the best way of doing things. uh, Hard wisdom is realistic. Pure wisdom is emboldening, helps us walk uprightly. Uh, Hard wisdom is humbling. Pure wisdom is hopeful, happy is the man, Proverbs says, uh, and, and yet uh, hard wisdom is regretful. And, and so the theme of this 
passage we're going to look at today, again, we're going to see this in, in uh, the end of chapter 9, the beginning of chapter 10, wisdom or the wise are mentioned 10 times here, so we'll see that again. Last time we talked about the all-in life uh, uh, at the beginning of chapter 9 and the fact that we only get one shot at this life under the sun. And so I, I challenged you last week, uh, asked the question, are you living the all-in life, the, the kind of life that you just put all the chips on the table? And so that's where we finished off last time. Uh, we'll pick up this passage here in, in, here in a second in verse 13 is where we'll be reading this morning. But let me ask you this. Do you know what your, i got to say this right, pineal gland is? Anybody know what the pineal gland is? So med students, uh, uh, Tate's nodding his head. Uh, Savannah and Lucy were here. They, they would know what that is. Uh, anybody just totally lost on what the pineal gland is? Okay, good. Uh, I'll, I'll maybe give you a little insight on the pineal gland. So it is the smallest organ in the human body. It's located in the center of the brain. And its main function is to receive information about our light and dark cycles. Okay, meaning day and night, day and night time. And so it lets the body know when it's time to sleep. And it, it begins this process of producing melatonin. Uh, so that happens at night, starting a couple hours before we normally go to bed. So if you're on a regular sleep cycle, uh, a few hours before you go to bed, your body starts producing this melatonin. And as, as you get into, and this is what makes you sleepy, Okay, so you start getting sleepy, and then you lay down and go to bed, and the body continues to produce melatonin throughout the night. So a deficiency of this melatonin, it will cause you to be restless. It will cause insomnia, uh, maybe waking up too early or having other sleep disorders. It, it will cause uh, some dysfunction in your sleep. And so if you if you're, have some sleep dysfunction, uh, usually it's a, a signal to your body that you're not producing enough melatonin. Okay? And so although the pineal gland is small, it's the smallest organ of the body, it's very vital to our health, both our physical and mental health, okay? It's very important. And so isn't this cool that God just knows what he's doing when he put the human body together? He didn't miss anything here, did he? And so, uh, you know, the in intricate design that God made the human body I don't know how much evidence you need of a divine creator. Uh, who, I mean, uh, how would that pineal gland get there? Except there's a divine designer that says, okay, I'm going to put this there because you need this thing. God's just good, isn't he? And that's just one, one little piece. We could, we could spend the rest of the day talking about the, the design of the human body and how intricate it is and how awesome God is in designing it. This is just one example. The little, this little gland in your body makes a big difference to your health and well-being. There's many other things like that in life that are little things that make a big difference. Let me give you a couple of other examples. How about your actions and your attitudes? Doing just a small, simple, kind deed for someone many times whew, just goes a long way. It's huge in the life of somebody. Giving someone a little hug when someone's having a bad day, it's just like a breath of fresh air. It's just encouraging. Having a good attitude in, in an adverse circumstance can be an encouragement to others. And we just don't know how those things can impact others in such a huge way. And yet they're very simple things that we can do, right? What about in, uh, in just our uh, uh, literary terms, punctuation marks and accent marks. You know, a sentence that ends in a period is greatly different from a sentence that ends in an exclamation point. <laughs> Very different, isn't it? See, there, those are, and it's just a matter of a little bitty marking. Jesus talked about this when he talked about uh, that the, the law is not going to pass. He said one jot or tittle of the law won't pass. That jot is the, the smallest letter of the Hebrew al alphabet. The tittle is the smallest of accent marks that will change one, uh, change the meaning of a, a, of a letter or a word, just the very slightest thing. And Jesus said those things won't pass. 
one jot or tittle won't pass. All the law will be fulfilled. See, little things can make a huge difference, can't they? And so that's what this passage that we're going to read today is, a, is about. It's about the little things that make a huge difference. And it does matter what we do. The little matters matter. Life's little matters matter. That's the title of our message today. So let's pick it up here in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 in verse 13. And let's look at these life's little matters. This wisdom have I seen also under the sun, and it seemed great unto me. There was a little city, and few men within it. And there came a great king against it, and besieged it, and built great bulwarks against it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no man remembered that same poor man. Then said I, Wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. The words of wise men are heard and quiet more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. Chapter 10, dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. Yea, also when he is... Uh, when. He that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him, and he saith to everyone that he is a fool. Father, this morning as we again open your word, Lord, we need to hear from you. We need to know uh, your uh, wisdom. Father, we can so easily think that we're good and we're okay, that we've got, uh, we're operating by our own wisdom, our own strength, and yet, Lord, Show us our deficiencies today, even in this passage. Show us where we, where and how much we need you. And Father, help us to, to pay attention to the little things that make a big difference. The little things that uh, we do, the, the little things we say, the little things that we think change our thinking, Lord, to line up with yours. So we, we, we think right and we, we do right. Lord, we need your leading. We need your word today. So please guide us in it. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's talk about this little city first. So this will be our first point through uh, the end of chapter 9. Uh, Solomon talks about this little city. So often cities are, are viewed like, like people. Okay, so let me give you some examples. So large cities, they're a little like people who are larger than life kind of individuals. Okay, flashy. They're seen by everyone, seem to be, you know, having a lot going on. They're always in the middle. These would be kind of extroverted, but not necessarily just uh, defining extroverted, extroverted kind of people. These are people who are always busy. Uh, everyone is drawn to them. They kind of have a magnetic kind of personality, just like big cities do. And, and there's an alluring appeal about them. See the lights. Oh, wow, I want to go there. I want to go oh, I'm not going to break into a song about New York, but, you know, this is, this is the, the, the allure of New York City, isn't it? And so these kind of people, they're dynamic. They say th things like, they're dynamic. They speak with such forcefulness and power and dy dynamic. And they appear to have it all together. And so some people, uh, just like some big cities, have a flair about them. So what are some of those big cities? What's the big cities of the world? Well, New York, Los Angeles, those are in our country here. Hollywood is connected to that. Hollywood, ooh, big, oh, awesome. London, Paris, Seoul, Beijing, Tokyo, Mumbai. The allure of the big draws us in many times, doesn't it? But let's think about, for a moment, the small cities. And they're a little like people also people who are a little non-assuming types of people, uh, tucked away, hidden, not known by everyone, prefer to kind of fly under the radar, tend to maybe move at a slower pace, can go unnoticed and easily be overlooked. And so some people just have kind of a small town nature about them, don't they? It's kind of like my hometown of Springfield, Missouri. You ever heard of it? Probably not, <laughs> maybe, maybe barely. Uh, you know, it's not the same Springfield on The Simpsons. So if you're thinking Simpsons, different Springfield. 
that's how obscure my Springfield is. So this is my hometown. And so people who have this hometown feel to them, like, like the hometown, small towns, rarely are in the spotlight. And sometimes they're even looked down upon and despised a little bit. Can you relate? Cities and people, a little bit like, like that. So this was the case in, in the Old Testament. We've got a story. Uh, we won't fully expound this story this morning. But this was the case with the little city of Ai. This little city of Ai, Ai was, was just a small little town close by Jericho. Jericho was a big, flashy city. Ai was just this little small town. And uh, as Israel went to this little small town, there was, there was just one, one man, his name was Achan, who ended up making a big difference, not for good, made a big difference in, in this whole big nation, tribe of Israel. And so I'll read part of the story here in Joshua chapter 7. It says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent, Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth Aven, on the east side of Bethel. And spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed it, viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Ah, no problem, Joshua. Let all the people don't don't let not all the people go up, but about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. And make not all the people to labor thither, for they, they are but few. So there went up thither of the people about three hundred or three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. So this little town of Ai, this little city, with small number of people in it, surprised this large nation of Israel and did some great damage, chased them out. Achan was just one guy who committed just one little trespass. He took a little bit of the spoil from the city of Jericho, but his little sin was great, and it affected a great number of people. And they ended up, at the end of chapter 7, covering him with a great heap of stones. Listen to what Achan's end was. Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. And so this is Solomon's point in this passage we just read this morning. Seemingly small and insignificant things can end up making a huge difference. And so life's little matters do matter. For good or for bad, for, for good or evil, the little things you do can and do make a huge difference. A little city with few men in it and seemingly insignificant uh, uh, an insignificant poor wise man, Solomon says, took down a great king with great bulwarks. Bulwarks are just weapon, weaponry and artillery. This, this army that had all the goods came in against a city to besiege it, and one poor wise man delivered that city, Solomon said. This is David defeating Goliath. This is the underdog story. Everybody likes an underdog story. Only once it's happening. Tell me an underdog you knew about before they were an underdog. See, nobody pays any attention to them, and usually afterwards you don't pay any attention to them either, unless they continue to, you know, defeat giants. See, no one noticed or cared until they defied the odds. And so the little wisdom of this seemingly insignificant man, Solomon said, made a big difference, and yet everybody forgot him. Isn't this how it works? Isn't this how our human nature works? We love the underdog story. Yeah, oh, go, go. And then, you know, when their great victory is over, so they're, they're easily forgotten. So by God's estimation, 
Sometimes things that seem great are really little. Don't miss this. Sometimes things that we think are great and awesome and, and alluring and attractive in God's estimation of things are very little. Great men, great kings, great bulwarks don't mean anything necessarily to God. By the world's view of great, totally different than God's view of great. Listen to a couple of examples of this. Job 32 verse 9 is one of the classic examples of this because Job tells us great men are not always wise. Neither do the aged understand judgment. Sometimes people who seem great, if they lack wisdom, are just a big, big uh, vexation of spirit with no substance. Listen to what Psalm 37 says. This is a good passage in Psalm 37, verse 35. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. In other words, bowed up, I'm strong, look at me. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. And then my favorite verse in the Bible, Mark the perfect man. And behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. See, you've got to keep reading, uh, or, or you think it's talking about me. Verse 38, but the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off, but the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble, and the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. See, Little guy, little girl, big God. See, little things don't scare God like they do us. So Christian, don't fall for the world's view of great. Just got to have it all. Have the highest profile job, have the highest income, flashiest cars and most expensive homes. Don't fall for it. Bigger is not always better. Flashy is not always the best. Can't miss out on the latest thing. Get the big tickets to the big game. Courtside seats. Everybody sees you. Get to get, you know, on the big jumbotron, TV. Everybody knows you. Knows you. you want to get all the newest gadgets. See, these kind of folks feel the need to be noticed, and being noticed makes them feel important and makes them feel big. And in God's estimation of things, ain't big at all. Ain't no big thing. See, this is the lie of social media, isn't it? We talk about this from time to time. Don't buy the lie. I'm somebody because I have a lot of likes. Big likes, no big deal to God. You want to do that thing that nobody else is doing and then post it so everyone can be impressed that you did this big thing that nobody else did. Watch out. It's just an alluring lie. So you may achieve all those things and not get one step closer to God. All that big stuff you thought was so important, so, such a thrill and such a, uh, you know, a rush and, and gets people's attention on you. And yet Proverbs says, Proverbs 15, 16, better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Oh my goodness. Give me just a little bit with the fear of the Lord any day. Proverbs 16, 8, better is little with righteousness than great revenues without right. Oh, God, in your eyes, it's great to be right with you, even if I got nothing else. I want to be that. So, church, we can't fall for this either. We've got to be careful. Brothers and sisters, we've got to be careful in how we view things 
e even in, in worship services and, and how we uh, proceed in things with the Lord and ministry, we've got to be careful how we view things. We've got to make sure we're seeing things rightly. See, flashy services with a lot of smoke and lights doesn't add anything to the mission, does it? Heidi, we don't need smoke and lights. Thank you. Thank you for not bringing in the smoke and lights. We don't need that show. Now, we're not trying to be drab and boring either. And, and you know, our worship team brings us to the, 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 the praise and throne of God. And so we're, we're not trying to be, you know, I have to be spiritual, you know, and so I have to be drab and boring. No, that's not what we're talking about. But we're not trying to be flashy, okay? We're not trying to impress anyone or bring notice to us. We just want our God to be glorified, and so that's worthy. And so we can get a nice building. And God has, God has blessed us. We're so grateful. But we could go in and we could get just the right lighting, get just the right audio visuals, just the right wow factor, Get a dynamic speaker, you know, move me out. Get somebody in who can really speak dynamically <laughs> and say all the right things and get all the right classrooms for our kids and our youth and do all the right things, and we can get all of that stuff. And let me tell you something. We haven't done anything yet. None of that stuff brings us any closer to fulfilling the mission that God wants us to fulfill other than the fact that we need some of those things to fulfill the mission, but those things don't accomplish the mission. You know what accomplishes the mission? This little business of, of us spending time together and investing in the souls of people, that's where the kingdom gets accomplished, not with buildings and lights and wow factors. None of that does anything. Until the word of God is opened... To change the lives of people, absolutely nothing is getting accomplished. And we've got to remember that. We've got to keep that in our scope. Unless people are coming to Christ and growing up in the word and maturing as spiritual leaders, we haven't done anything. I don't care how pretty we make that property. and we're, we, we want to do our, our best. Again, we're not trying to be drab and boring. We're not trying to, you know, uh, under-impress. You know, we just want the Lord to be glorified, and, and we don't want to ever stop in the mission he's given to us. And so to our dads this morning, don't miss this great principle. You ever heard the term Disney dad? Dads, don't be Disney dad. Disney dad is the dad who thinks they have to buy things for their kids to make their kids like them. To be great in my kids' eyes means I got to get them all the stuff. I got to, uh, you know, work a 80-hour work week so I can buy all the things that I think my kids will be impressed with. Let me tell you something, dads. Your kids, especially if they're young, they don't care how flashy you are. They don't care how awesome you are at your job. They don't care how liked you are by everyone else. They don't care how much praise and recognition you get outside the home. None of that matters to them. Dad, they want you. They want you. They want your time. They want the little things that you do that will show them how much you really love and care about them. And that happens in the little things. Just getting on the floor with him and wrestling. Just clearing your schedule and just saying, today it's, it's daddy time. We're just going to hang. Man, if we could get that. They need your little prayers. They need those moments of little good character out of you. Oh, how I failed in that and many times. They need your daily spiritual input into their lives. And if you don't do anything else, if you don't have a flashy job or a big 
six-figure income and, and you just invest your time and your life into your kids, it'll be, it'll be gold. It's worth more than anything, dads. By God's estimation, sometimes things that seem to be little are really great. So let's talk about this for a minute. See, God can do so much with little cities and few men and just a poor wise man. It doesn't take much. God, in fact, sometimes it just give God the, the bare minimum. And he's like, that's exactly what I need. The less man can take the credit, the more credit goes to the Lord. So God delights getting glory out of humble little things. And so we see another story in the Old Testament in the book of Judges where God whittled down an army of 32,000 men and he said, nope, too many. I can't get glory out of that. Let's, let's try to bring it down. So they, they whittled out 10,000, got it down to 22,000. God says, nope, still too big. So they took the guys, I'm just going to paraphrase the story rather than us reading it, but he took these guys down to the river. He said, Joshua said, bring them down to the river, or not Joshua, Gideon said, bring them down to the river bank. And, and the ones that, uh, you know, just throw their whole face down in the water and start uh, lapping up the water, send them home. The ones that go and pick up the water with their hands, and he's teaching them or, or looking for the most diligent uh, of the group, those that pick up the water and drink this way out of, out of the water, yeah, I want those guys. And so this 22,000 guys went down, and they only found 300 that, that with vigilance drank from the water, and God says, perfect. 300, that's all I need. And God took that little army of 300 and won a great victory. Jesus told his disciples this same thing. Jesus talked about the greatest in his kingdom would be the greatest servants. Listen to what he says in Mark chapter 10, verse 42. But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Praise God, this is what many of you did yesterday over at the property that we spent some hours sweating together on with selfless, sacrificial sweat, triple S. You guys are awesome. And so you served with gloves and shovels and hatchets. No one, from what I saw, no one was looking to, to uh, you know, be served. You guys came to serve. Praise the Lord. I'm so thankful for our, our church family and for uh, just the sacrificial service you brought yesterday. And it's just a, a snapshot of what we are all the time. Unless I do something about this, I'm going to just be struggling the rest of the service here. It's also what many of you do on a regular basis here at LFT. And so let's just talk about some of the little things that, that make a big difference. You know, when you serve your brothers and sisters with sacrificial love, your little sacrifices matter. When you come and you show up here on a, on a Friday or Saturday, Friday night or Saturday to clean the church, you make it nice for the rest of us for a service, those of you on our cleaning teams, just sacrificially coming and cleaning, the little time you spend doing that makes a difference for the rest of us. When we pray together or with a brother or sister that's in need, sometimes it's, it's a very, just the very simplest of acts to pray with someone, labor in prayer, and those prayers God sees as great. They matter. When you offer a hand of help to a brother or sister in need, your little bit of time and selflessness matters. And let's talk about the ministry 
itself and, and spiritual input in the lives of people. When you meet with a brother or sister for discipleship, in the large scope of things, this is such a small thing to do. God, I, I don't have to be all that. I don't have to be flashy. I just want to be faithful with your word and, and, and no one even else has to see. And when we have these discipleship relationships, many of you don't even know, or some of you may not even know, all of the relationships that are going on right now in regards of disciple making right now in, at LFT. And the reason you don't know is because we don't have people saying, hey, we're meeting over here. No, it's just one person going uh, in, in, in a simple, uh, quiet time with one other person and investing the word of God into them. One life into another. It's not flashy. It's not the way you're going to build a big church fast if that's, what, if that's what we were after. That's not how you would do it. And yet, this is the way Jesus said to do things. Investing the word into the souls of people. And some of you are doing that in the quiet and no one else is noticing. No one else even may know what, when or, or how that's happening. And yet we see much of the world and even professing Christians sometimes see this as an insignificant waste of time. Oh, you know, we're trying to figure out how to get more people in the seats of our church instead of getting more of the word into people. Let me tell you, this little matter matters. It's huge for us. When you take time to share the gospel with someone who is lost, which so few Christians actually do today, your little sacrifice of time that may inconvenience you and perhaps make it be a little awkward, sharing the gospel can be very awkward to someone who's not ready or, or wants to hear it. It can be very awkward. That little matter <sighs> matters <laughs> more than we could ever even imagine until we're one day in glory with the Lord and we see what salvation really means. We can't really even get our heads sco scoped around that, can we? You sharing the gospel with a lost soul matters. And many of you do that on a regular basis. Keep doing those little matters. And our church is little and seemingly insignificant. We've just got a small group of people here, and the world may look at that and despise us and say, well, you're just a small little group of people. What can you do? Even other Christians may look down on us and despise us. Brothers and sisters, don't for a moment let that deter you. Don't despise the small things that are great to God. This is his bride, and we will never despise his bride. Listen what Zechariah says in verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 10. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. With those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 28. And base things, low things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. God loves the small things. He doesn't despise little. 1 Corinthians 4.10. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Brothers and sisters, your life may seem insignificant at times. But with a big God, your life can make a big difference and a big impact on the lives of other people. By the world's standards, only big things are worthwhile and only big things count. And so you've got to make a big splash on the world or you're just not important, the world says. You've got to make a lot of money and have really nice things or be well known or have power and prominence. And to the world, this is what success looks like. But none of those are big to God. It's the small and seemingly insignificant things that make and mean the most to God. 
the things that the world sees as insignificant, the things that the world despises, the things that the world looks at and scoffs at. Brothers and sisters, I'll take being the poor, little, despised, and forgotten wise man all day. How about you? Do you take it? Do you own it? That's, that's perfect, Lord. <laughs> because this kind of wisdom, Solomon says, is better than strength. Even though the world is going to look at this kind of activity and despise it, God says it's awesome. So many, even some professing Christians, will dismiss your words and not listen. This is what Solomon says. He says, then, uh, then said I, wisdom is better than strength. Verse 16, nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. Don't let this discourage you or stop you, brother or sister. Nobody's listening? Okay. See, we don't share the gospel to get results of people coming to Christ. Do you, you understand? We share the gospel to be obedient to what God told ask us to do. And if nobody listens, okay, I'm just going to keep being obedient. We don't disciple people because it's a, it's a great way to, to grow a big church and to get uh, praise and honor for ourselves. No, that's not why we disciple. We disciple people to be obedient to what the Lord asks us to do. And if it doesn't do anything for us and he gets glorified, that's enough. So many, even some professing Christians, will dismiss your words. Don't let that deter you. Don't let it stop you. The words of a wise man are heard and quiet more than the cry of him that uh, ruleth among fools, Solomon says. There's a lot of people trying to make their splash in the world. Let them cry. <laughs> let them get all the attention and prestige and glory they want. Keep doing those little seemingly insignificant and unnoticed things, brothers and sisters, that make a big difference. See, this kind of wisdom Solomon finishes here in this chapter and says this kind of wisdom is better than bulwarks, better than weapons of war. You can make a big difference with just the sword of the word of God in your hand and let it do its work. I don't have to have anything else. God, I've got enough. I've got this, this little book. And hold that, hold that forth. And let it change people's lives. All right, let's finish up with chapter 10 here. First few verses. And here's our next point. Little folly. Let's talk about the little folly that Solomon talks about. So he begins this chapter talking about the fly and the ointment. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. And so a fly in the ointment is a saying that's still used Today, in fact, I heard this phrase just a couple of days ago while I was uh, listening to a uh, baseball game on the radio. Yes, I'm a baseball nerd. Uh, it's okay. I, I, I listen to baseball games on the radio. That's how nerdy I am about baseball. But anyway, I digress. The, the phrase was said on the radio. It mentioned the fly in the ointment. And so this phrase refers to something that is a drawback or a detriment or a defect that spoils something that would otherwise be uh, enjoyable or valuable. It's, 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 the, it's the downside of something that normally would be good or normally would be, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, the, would, would be enjoyable, okay? So if you... Uh, about a month or so ago, I got to go to a Royals baseball game with my son. It was awesome. But there's a fly in the ointment. My favorite baseball team stinks. <laughs> and they lost, like they've been doing most of the time this season. And so that was a fly in the ointment. You know, got to be with my son. We got to hang out. We had a good time. Uh, when we first got there, we were like the only people within like a thousand chairs of us around us that were empty. Uh, got to spend time with my son. But the fly in the ointment, yeah, my stinking team lost. So the ointment of the apothecary that he mentions here, the apothecary is the, the mixture of oils and spices. And so these mixtures were prepared by the priests uh, who were qualified to prepare that. And so they would put, mix this apothecary together. But sometimes flies would get in that and would ruin that mixture. And so instead of sending a pleasant 
smell, the flies would, would uh, defile that mixture and cause it to stink. And so what should have been, uh, you know, something of value, that ointment, and what should have been something of, that was praiseworthy, worship to the Lord with the ointment going up, instead it turned out to be an unsavory thing. This is the fly in the ointment. Good ointment, good purpose to praise God with, but the flies messed it up. And so Solomon compares this to someone who is known for wisdom and yet acts foolishly. So this changes the perception of a person. When someone who should be acting a certain way doesn't act that way, doesn't respond that way with wisdom, well, it just doesn't fit. And so it makes a little folly really stand out. And sometimes we would, we would call this someone acting out of character, someone who is doing something they wouldn't normally do. But this little folly, Solomon says, can also make a big difference, not for good. And so just a little foolishness of sin in your life can make a big impact on others for the worse. So let me give you an example. I've given this example before. All of you haven't heard it, so I'm going to give it again. So I'm going to make a pan of brownies for you. Everybody loves a good pan of brownies. Tate and Aaron, they would devour some brownies when they come over to a Bible study. Uh, we make brownies every once in a while. I don't make the kind of brownies I'm going to describe, but uh, uh, I'm going to make a pan of brownies for you. And, you know, <clears throat> mix it all up, but I'm just going to, get a little bit of my dog's poop from the yard, just a little bit. It's just going to be a very little tiny bit, and I'm going to put it in those brownies. I don't know. Tate and Aaron may still eat them. I don't know. <laughs> but that little poop is going to make most of you run for the hills away from those brownies. I ain't touching those brownies. I don't even want to look at them. I don't want to be near them. I may never eat a brownie again. Just a little bit of poop. Isn't this how it works? See, when you choose to live your life in the flesh, even just a little, it can affect a lot, can't it? It can make a big impact for the worse, can't it? Your little bit of unfaithfulness can affect your brothers and sisters in Christ. Your little bit of absence from the body of Christ, well, I've only missed, you know, a few Sundays. It affects others. Your little selfishness steals from others. Your refusal to humble yourself, that spreads to others. And now we have others being affected by just your little bit of folly. The Bible calls this leaven. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. This is what, is hap what was happening in the church at Corinth. There was a man in the church of Corinth, just one man. He was having an immoral relationship. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 5. An immoral relationship with someone else's wife is actually his father's wife, his stepmom. And it was just one man's sin, but it was affecting an entire church. And so Paul wrote to this church, and he said in 1 Corinthians 5, 6, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. Get that poop out of there. That ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. This is what God said to do uh, the nation of Israel. He said, if you've got to do your business, sorry to talk a lot about, you know, doing the business today, but you got to do your business, go outside the camp because we don't want that in here. We don't want people stepping in that. Get, go outside the camp. Keep it outside because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Paul warned this uh, to the church, gave this warning to the church of Galatia as well. There were some who thought it was okay to be entangled with the yoke of bondage of their flesh. They had been saved, and yet they kept going back to legalism. They kept going back to the bondage of sin. And they weren't obeying the truth of the word of God, and it was affecting others. And so he wrote in Galatians 5, 7, Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? 
This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. In other words, your going back to that junk is affecting other people. Stop. Stop. Now, brothers and sisters, I get it. We have sin. We are sinful people. We all have a little of that leaven in us. I get it. But when we put ourselves in a perpetual state where, you know, I don't care. I'm just going to do it. It's only affecting me. If you are a part of Living Faith Tampa, if you have a family, if you have other people that you love around you, it's not just affecting you. It does spread. And so we need to be right with our God. We need to be getting things right. We all sin. We all, we all have issues, okay? This isn't saying we have to, you know, be uh, sinless people. We, we aren't. I get that. But we need to understand how our poop affects others. <laughs> it does. It affects other people. And so we got to make sure we're dealing with it. Okay? Sorry, no more poop. <laughs> the book of James gives us some of these little things that can have a big effect too. Turn with me over to James. Hold your place in Ecclesiastes. Turn over to James chapter 3. James gives us this, some examples here as well of little things that make a big difference. In James chapter 3, verse 1, he says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. And so here's one of his examples. We put bits in horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Next example, behold also the ships, which though they be great and are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. And then here's his third example, which is really his point of this chapter. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. So we put a bridle in a horse's mouth. A bridle in comparison to the horse is small, and yet we can turn the whole horse. The helm in comparison to the ship is small, but it can turn an entire ship. And by comparison, your tongue... It's just a small piece of, of you, and yet it can make a big impact for good or for bad. See, uh, uh, James says it can start fires that become destructive. You can use your tongue to be argumentative. You can use your tongue to be critical and point out flaws in others. You can use your tongue to be judgmental. There's a lot of things you can tear down other people with and start fires with and kindle fires and other people with your tongue. And oh, we're good at that sometimes, aren't we? Or you can use your tongue to strengthen and to encourage. You can give a compliment to someone in place of a criti criticism. You can give good advice to someone. You can offer an apology when you, you know, some of the hardest words, but the uh, most powerful words in our vocabulary was, I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. You can use the tongue to say please and thank you. You can use the tongue to say I love you. See, we've got a lot of power we're, we're wielding in this little member. Oh, we would do well to think before we speak so we don't send forth a stinking savor with our foolish words. So dad's a little quick word on this to you this morning. You have a great responsibility here, dad's. The little things you do and say can have a profound, big impact on your kids. If you consistently allow little areas of your flesh to surface in your life, it's an eventually going to come out and, and impact your kids. You think, well, I'm just doing this myself, and this is my own private thing. No, it will come out, and it will affect your kids. Allowing sinful thoughts and actions just to linger there, they won't just affect you. It'll spread to your spouse, it'll spread to your kids, and often it, it will be the leaven that will leaven the whole lump of the family. Dads, be careful, and especially with your words, as James instructs us here, your little words can make big impacts for good or for not so good. So those times that you lose your temper, Dad, may seem little to you. Well, it's just one little temper. I just got a little frustrated. Guess who's watching? Your critical words, those can have an impact. 
not just your words to your kids, dads, don't, don't forget, your words to your wife, those make a big impact too. In fact, those might be even more important words in what your kids are hearing you say to, to your spouse. And what you say to and about other people will impact your kids too. If you're, if you're just all the time ripping other people to shreds around your kids, you just don't know what that's going to do to them. Dads, you would do well to watch what you say, who you say it to, and how you say it. We just got to pay attention to our little words. See, your little folly can spread a long way to your kids, and so we've got to shut those things off when we get opportunity to, to shut those down. And sometimes we got to go back to our kids' dads and say, you know what, dad was wrong. Dad didn't speak rightly. I didn't, I didn't do rightly. And we got to ask forgiveness. So Solomon goes on to say, he says the next thing he mentions here in verse 2 is interesting. He says, a wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left and so throughout the Bible, the right hand is a picture of, of several things. It's a picture of blessing. It's a picture of, of righteousness. And it's a picture of, of strength. We don't have time to look at all the verses, but uh, in, in uh, the book of Genesis, uh, Israel, Jacob blessed his, his grandson Ephraim with his right hand. He purposely put his hand to the younger son, Ephraim, to give him his blessing with his right hand. Uh, we, we see in the, uh, in the Psalms, the righteous hand of God, Psalm 48, 10, according to thy name, O God, so is thy praise unto the ends of the earth. Thy right hand is full of righteousness. We also see the strength of God's right hand in Psalm 20, verse 6. Now, now know I that the Lord sa saveth his anointed. He will hear from his holy heaven and with the saving strength of his right hand in Psalm 89, 13. Thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand and thy and high is thy right hand. And so we see these three things, blessing and righteousness and strength coming from the right hand. Uh, the left hand many times falls short of that. Uh, and so this is true in our human bodies as well. Uh, where, where is your heart located? In the center? Yes, but just a little off center to the left. Just a slight move to the to the left don't miss this picture brothers and sisters God God is just just so thorough on how he does things man's heart is just a little off on our own we're just a little off center and we're we're, we're just miss it a little bit when someone is having a heart attack uh, typically it, it's felt on the left side of the body and so God just doesn't miss a beat uh, on things like this. These little pictures, these little things matter. God is telling us, you got to get your heart under my strength. You got to get your heart under my blessing. You got to get your heart under uh, my righteousness and not, not trust in your own because your heart is just a little off. And so this is what Solomon's trying to, to teach us here. here. The wise man's, uh, a wise man will pursue after God's blessing and his righteousness and his strength, not depending on their own. The fool's pursuit after his own way will be evident. And so Solomon goes on to say here that, uh, uh, yea, also, in verse 3, when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him. And he saith to everyone that he is a fool. So a fool's pursuit is evident to others. When he walks by the way, his wisdom fails him, Solomon says. A fool can't help but be a fool. Oh God, help us. Because sometimes we can't help but be the fool. God, help us. We need your help. A fool just can't help but stink up the ointment of the apothecary. And so many times the fool is going to think that it's everyone else that stinks. I've, you know, a phrase that my uh, old youth pastor taught me is, is uh, if the whole world stinks, your lip is dirty. 
You get it? You think it's everybody else. The stink is on you. Watch out. Oh, fool. Watch out. Before you go pointing fingers at everybody else, before you say it's everybody else's problem, it's everybody else's fault, it's everyone else that's out of line, clean your lip, get right with your God, and see things how he sees things. How are the little follies of your life affecting others? See, we can affect others for good or for bad. How are those little vanities? So life's little matters, they do matter. It does matter how you live today. It does matter how you operate. The important and wise little things, they can go a long way for good. Or those regretful and foolish little things can go a long way for evil. Life's little matters matter. Let me pray, and then Josh is going to come up. And uh, before I pray, Emily, come up here with me. So Emily is going away to school this week. And so we want to pray for you, and so I'm going to pray for you right now. She's, she's uh, getting an early start at uh, the University of Florida, and so uh, we're going we're gonna to miss you, seeing you on a more regular basis, but you're going to be here every time you're in town. You're going to come see us. Yes, yes, yes. So we, we love you, and we, we, uh, we want to pray for you. So let me pray for Emily, and then Josh, you come up. Father, thank you this morning for your word. Uh, life's little matters do matter, and it does matter how we live. It does matter what we say and, and how we order our lives, and, and sometimes in the very simplest and smallest of details, that's where we're going to find you. And so, Lord, help us in those things. Help us to do evaluation of our own lives and to, under, and to see those little areas that were, are neglected in our life, the little things that we're uh, doing or not doing that make a big difference. And so God, help us to see those things. And Lord, this morning also, I just want to pray for our sister Emily. Lord, we uh, are so thankful for the relationship you've given us with her. And we want to pray for her as she uh, just launches out in this new uh, uh, just uh, period of her life, Lord, and, and trusting you for uh, her education. And God, I, I want to pray in a couple different ways. First of all, we just pray for uh, just a smooth move in process and, and school and all of that to go well for her. But God, I also just pray for her spiritual protection and, and provision. And God, that, that there be a, a, a church and other believers that you could quickly get her connected to in Gainesville, Lord. So she has encouragement and strength there, Lord. Would you just give her those folks and uh, where, where she can to be here with us and be a part of this body. Lord, we're just so thankful uh, for the opportunity you've given us just to, to love on her and minister to her. And so, Lord, would you just have your hand on her as she prepares for this part of her, her journey. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're, we, we'll close with Josh this morning. So, yeah, come on up, Josh. And so we'll, we'll hold off on some music. Josh wants to give us an update on some things. I might actually sing a cappella. <laughs> Man, I feel a little bit like a fly in the ointment uh, coming up here after that. I was certain you were going to say who, who smelt it, dealt it, though. Anybody else? <laughs> I thought that's what you learned. But, um, well, hey, we want to give a little bit of update on the property. Uh, and so uh, I feel like we you know, get up here and kind of say a lot of the same things. Um, but, man, this is something we started praying about over a year ago. And it was not only that, I remember even just talking about becoming independent. And, and it's, really, it's really funny. The, the goal was July 1st. Uh, to become independent, and, and that happened a lot quicker, uh, and, and so, uh, I mean, we just want to thank God for that, and then here we are, uh, we closed on the property, uh, you know, last week, and so uh, God has given us uh, answers to that prayer, and, and, and so, um, you know, just don't miss these, you know, these things happening in this season that we're going through as a church of God's provision. Uh, we'd be really foolish to miss these things, and so, uh, it's really awesome, and so you, uh, there's some pictures up on the screen. I don't know if they've changed or not. Have they been changing a little bit? Or, okay. So this Tate, yeah, he ripped that tree out with his bare hands, and so, yeah. So these are just some pictures from the work day we had yesterday, um, just cleaning up around the property outside. Um, and you know what? I want to talk about these things here for a moment because um, you know these are these are these are sweet times. 
Uh, but at the same time, this, uh, you know, I can't help but think about the folks from Maranatha. And we, we need to continue to pray for them. Uh, you know, this, this is a place that they've loved and, and, and served at for a long, long time. And so, uh, you know, a sign coming down, you know, that's, uh, you know, it, it's tough. And, and so, you know, we want to continue to be sensitive, pray for everybody there. I know we have a few folks here, too, and, we, and we're thankful to have you here. But continue to pray for uh, those folks who are still looking to get plugged in and a part of a church. And so as we do these improvements, uh, you know, really just cleaning up, I mean, there's, you know, we're just trying to be good stewards and, and, and manage the, the things that the Lord has given us. That's all we're doing. We're not, I was thankful to hear you, Pastor Mark, just even talk about that today. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, what color paint the building is. Uh, you know, I hope, I hope that that's not what draws people in. Yeah, if that is, oh my goodness, you know, what a mess we're going to have on our hands. But it won't be because uh, we're going to share the gospel. We're going to be on mission, and, and that's what's going to draw people into his body. And so, but these are just some cool things. Mark's ripping up trees with his, you know. When that was happening, I was sitting there thinking, that's probably unnecessary, but I'm glad we did. You know, it was fun, you know. And, and so, uh, but as these pictures go, uh, you know, just, you know, we'll be indoors next week for those who are thinking there's no way I'm doing that again. Uh, we're going to be doing some demolition in air conditioning. And so that'll be cool. But, um, you know, we see this process has started We've seen it become a reality now. Uh, we, the property, the Lord has given this property uh, to us. And so there's still uh, a reminder that there are people investing in the ministry at LFT. And it begins, you know, again, with, I mean, obviously we see with the Lord's work. But Maranatha, uh, you know, um, the investment that they made, um, selling this property far beyond, below market value uh, for us to have. That was an investment in the ministry here. And so we don't need to miss that. I know we've said this before. Uh, 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 Midtown Baptist Temple uh, gave us an interest-free loan so that we could purchase the, the property and, 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 you know, not empty everything that we have. And so, uh, you know, and they're in no hurry for us to pay them back. You know, we were praying this morning, and, and we want to be that same kind of church uh, in the future to a church that we plan out. Uh, and, and so, man, what an, uh, I mean, that just, it's awesome. I, I don't, I don't come from Midtown. I know a lot of folks here come from Midtown. I don't. Uh, and it's amazing, uh, to see, uh, the love and support, not just as a church, but individuals there who will give to this, uh, and who will come and they'll take their vacation time here over this summer and come down and, and do projects to update and, and, and serve on our property. I mean, if that doesn't get us to sit here and think, okay, what am I doing? I don't know what will. And, and, and so we see the investments being made by so many, and, and that's where the charge is at this morning is, is, is us, you, individually, and together as a body. You know, uh, how, how are we going to serve at, at uh, you know, this, this building that we're going to use for ministry? Okay, and, and so one of the things also that Midtown has offered to do is, is match up to 25000 in renovations, which is remarkable. Uh, you know, and so um, as of now, we wanted to give you an update of where we at. I think we started this the last week of May, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and so this has been about four weeks. This will be about the fourth Sunday that we really kind of put that out there. And so uh, where we're at right now is at $8,449. And so praise God for that. That's almost exactly a third of the way there, all right? And so, um, you know, I love Midtown, and it's, it's kind of the way we talk about it. It's like, man, we want that 25,000 match, guys. I mean, it would be, you know, uh, I'll make sure I'm not saying that in a weird way because that comes off weird, but that's why they offered it, all right? And, and they want to give it to us, but, but we, need to, we need to be willing to, you know, get into the game, invest in the ministry here, just like everyone else does. And so, um, you know, be praying about that. We don't want to convince anybody, you know, make you feel like you got to do something. We want this to be between you and the Lord uh, and to be praying about these things so that when you do it, yeah, it is sacrificial, but that you have peace, that you don't have resentment, that you're, you're cheerful about giving uh, uh, to this financially, okay? And that's the financial piece. There's also a physical piece, just the time. Uh, hey, your time is valuable. Uh, we know that. I mean, he talked today about, you know, spending time with your children. Yeah, there's, there's a part of this that it might take you away from uh, a Saturday morning with your family for a couple Saturdays 
or bring them out there, you know, uh, figure out a way to keep them busy. We had a lot of kids. You see Annie Bowen, Edward was out there, uh, Paul, Emily were out there, Louis was out there, the kids, they showed up yesterday, <laughs> right? Uh, but we had, I mean, it's just a great time. And so, you know, through all of this, yeah, it was hot. Yeah, I'm sore. Uh, you know, I, I, I did, actually, my melatonin did not kick in last night. I didn't sleep a wink because I took a long nap. And, and but man, I, I'll remember that day. I mean, I will remember, uh, you know, just having the sledgehammer out there and, and people taking some knocks at some things and hooking up the chains to the trees. And it was, I mean, yeah, I don't know why it was fun, but it was fun. And so, you know, these are memories that we're making, just fun times. And so be praying about how you can be a part of these things uh, over, the, over the summer. And so the giving uh, through the end of July, um, you know, have a little more than a month. Be praying about that. We, we, we definitely want to hit that 25,000 mark. Hey, if we blow right by it, praise God, we'll just keep going. And, and that's a good problem to have. And so, uh, but again, be praying about these things. I think that's the key here to, you know, pray about how to be involved here serving in these next this summer. And so, man, we got nine more Sundays here. Nine more. That's kind of crazy. And so it's going to be here fast. And so don't, don't wait too long to get involved. It's going to be here very, very soon. And so um, that's all I have. Anything else you want to add, correct? Uh, no, just pray for us. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm going to pray for us. After that, uh, we're dismissed, all right? Father, thank you um, just for your word. Um, uh, Lord, to, today, yeah, just to be here and um, just to, to see these fathers and have that, just the conviction from your word of how to be a better father uh, for all of us. Um, Lord, not only that, just for even for all of us here, Lord, just how to be on mission, uh, to do things in obedience, not uh, to try to look good, not to try to uh, do anything in our own wisdom, but Lord, just to uh, cling to your wisdom and Father, we need you desperately. Um, Lord, we, we don't want to uh, do any upgrades or renovations, uh, as Pastor Mark said, uh, to try to be um, wise in our own power. Lord, we just want to take care of what you've blessed us with. And, and, but, Father, we want to do things the way you've told us. We want to make disciples. Uh, Lord, we want to share the gospel. Uh, Lord, we want to uh, teach them to observe everything that you have commanded in your word. And so, uh, Father, we need your help. Uh, we, we know there's no power in us to accomplish that. Um, only through obedience and through the work and power of your Holy Spirit will that be done. And so, Father, we need you. And so, Lord, as we go out this door today, um, Lord, we pray we don't miss any opportunities. Uh, Lord, that our conversations, as small as they might be, uh, Lord, we know that they may be uh, very significant and really matter. And so, Lord, don't let us uh, take advantage of any of the time or miss any of the opportunities that we may have, uh, Lord, to bring glory to your name. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. song